An assassination attempt on the leader of Kitab Party, Pierre Jamail, unfolded in the suburb of Ain el Rumana. Simultaneously, the tragedy at Tel al Zadar claimed the lives of members of PLO. These two events served as the incendiary sparks that ignited the clashes between the forces of PLO and the Muslim community on one front, and the Lebanese Kitab Party and the Christian right wing on the other. The summer of 1975 descended upon Lebanon like a scorching crucible, where the pungent scent of spilled blood permeated the very soil, or coursed through the veins of the nation. A month following the events in Ain el Rumana, Prime Minister Rashid al Sol tendered his resignation. Subsequently, a military government was appointed under the leadership of Brigadier General Nur al-Din al-Rifai. However, the Rifai government also resigned shortly thereafter in response to protests from the Lebanese left wing. A new government, helmed by Rashid Karami, was formed. Concurrently, PLO declared its neutrality and respect for Lebanese sovereignty. Rashid Karami, declared the restoration of order and the re-establishment of security within the nation. Nevertheless, this tranquility proved short-lived, as the storm clouds gathered swiftly. Conflict erupted anew, and acts of violence extended even to innocent civilians. Hundreds lost their lives in identity-based killings, and despite all efforts to contain the crisis, the violence escalated, and the country simmered with the fires of anger. Though it was imperative for the military to intervene to preserve security and contain the situation, the Prime Minister hesitated, fearing the division of the armed forces, a calamity that everyone dreaded. Various Arab and Western parties attempted to mediate and bridge the rift, yet all endeavors met with failure. The cycle of violence persisted, claiming lives in a relentless frenzy. On the 6th of December, 1975, in the vicinity of Fanner, for lifeless bodies of Christian combatants belonging to Kitab Party were discovered. In a vengeful fervor, Christian militias affiliated with Kitab Party swiftly spread through the Beirut port area. They established checkpoints, and within hours, ruthlessly took the lives of hundreds of Palestinians and Lebanese Muslims. This incident became known as the Black Saturday Incident. The Lebanese national movement accused Bashir Jamail, the son of Pierre Jamail, of issuing the order to commence this massacre, although Kitab members later denied it. The intense clashes led to the division of Beirut into an eastern region predominantly Christian, and a western region predominantly Muslim. The conflict veered onto a path of retribution and vengeance, with hundreds of innocent lives being lost daily, Muslims and Christians alike. Following the Fanner incident, the Lebanese left-wing and Muslims were incensed, and calls emerged to respond to the Black Saturday massacre with a similar act. However, the response manifested on the ground as a strategic battle, in which Muslims and the leftist forces sought to gain control of the hotels adjacent to the Beirut port. They succeeded in capturing the area and driving out the Christian militias. Analysts regarded the Battle of the Hotels as one of the earliest combat fronts in the Lebanese Civil War. The year 1976 commenced with ferocious battles, in which leftist and Muslim forces achieved distinct victories over the militias of the Kitab Party and the Christian right wing. In response, the latter launched an offensive against the predominantly Muslim Carantina area, committing brutal acts of violence. Fighters from the Lebanese National Movement and the PLO, supported by Syria, retaliated with an assault on the predominantly Christian town of Damour, resulting in the deaths of hundreds. The Lebanese government found itself utterly impotent, and all its attempts to cease the bloodshed failed. Prime Minister Rashid Karami initially tendered his resignation, only to retract it in the hopes of halting the torrent of bloodshed and massacres plaguing the nation. 
Arab security forces were established under the guidance of the Arab League to maintain order. Earlier, before the fall of Damour, former president Camille Shamoun attempted to secure the support of the army. Initially, the army leadership refused to engage in a conflict between opposing parties. However, a catastrophic event unfolded when a faction of the Lebanese army, led by Lt. Ahmad al khadib defected. He established the Lebanese Arab Army, some of its members managed to seize a number of army tanks, and later, in collaboration with Palestinian forces, gained control of military positions along the road between Marjiyun and Rashaya. Subsequently, large-scale looting and plundering operations commenced in Beirut by both sides. In February 1976, President Suleiman Franji announced the constitutional document as a political solution to the crisis. It included a series of political reforms, most notably. 1. Affirming the prevailing tradition of sectarian power sharing in the three branches of government, the presidency held by Maronite Christians, the prime ministership by Sunni Muslims, and the parliamentary speaker by Shiite Muslims. 2. Equal distribution of seats in the parliament between Muslims and Christians. 3. The election of the prime minister by parliament members rather than appointment. However, the Lebanese left rejected the constitutional document as insufficient for reforming the political system. Calls for President Frangia's resignation grew louder, while fierce battles continued, with the joint forces making significant advancements against Christian militias. Nevertheless, President Hafez al-Assad pressed for a halt to the joint forces' attacks, rejecting military decisiveness in favor of a diplomatic and political solution to ensure Lebanon's unity. Despite all of Kamal Jumblat's efforts to persuade him to support the joint forces and their objectives, they ultimately failed. Meanwhile, the Kitab party in the Lebanese right wing had begun receiving direct support from Israel following discussions between Yitzhak Rabin, former president, Camille Shamoun, and Pierre Jamal. Thus, the land of Lebanon transformed into a battlefield, shared by external factions, driven by international and regional factors. It was no longer a conventional civil war, and when the American envoy, Dean Brown, visited Lebanon to address the crisis, Kamal Jumblat's perspective favored one side over the Christian faction. Some analysts perceived this as Washington's involvement, pushing for the continuation rather than the cessation of the war. Israel also declared that if Syrian intervention in Lebanon persisted, its forces would occupy southern Lebanon up to the Litani River. During that period, a significant shift occurred in the course of the war. The Syrian army began to align with the Christian Lebanese right wing and together they agreed to nominate a new candidate for the presidency, Elias Sarkis. In contrast, Kamal Jumblat and the Lebanese national movement rejected the Syrian candidate and supported another nominee, Raymond Ed, whose views aligned with the national movement and the Lebanese left. Their primary concern was the need for political system reforms and the cessation of Syrian interference. The national movement called for postponing the elections, but they proceeded despite the National Front's boycott. Sarkis was elected president with support from Yasser Arafat as well. All attempts at reconciliation between Syria and the national movement failed. On June 1, 1976, the Syrian army entered Lebanese territory to halt the advance of the joint forces, following a request from Christian right-wing leaders. In response, the national movement and the Palestinians rose up against Syrian forces, describing the Syrian intervention as an assault on Lebanese sovereignty. Some analysts mentioned that President Assad's decision to intervene was to embrace the Christian right wing and prevent them from aligning with Israel. However, this goal came at the expense of the Lebanese left and Muslims, sparking conflict among former allies.
The United States and the United Kingdom began evacuating their citizens after the assassination of the American ambassador in Lebanon. Simultaneously, the Christian right-wing forces, in cooperation with Syrian forces, tightened the siege around the Tel al zadr camp. Palestinian forces continued to resist the encirclement until the camp fell, resulting in massacres and an estimated 2,000 casualties. Syrian forces continued their advance towards Beirut, while the Christian Lebanese forces made progress. On the other hand, Palestinian and Lebanese leftist forces were retreating under immense pressure. A mini-Arab summit was convened in Riyadh for reconciliation among the Arab brethren. Kamal Jumblat, however, continued to describe the Syrian intervention in Lebanon as an occupation and called for its withdrawal. In the Arab summit held in Cairo, an Arab deterrent force was formed to halt Syrian overreach in Lebanon. Deterrent forces were deployed in Beirut, while in the south, cooperation between the Christian right-wing and Israeli forces was evident in preventing Palestinian presence in that strategically important region. The situation appeared to calm somewhat, leading some to believe that the war had ended. They dubbed it the Two Years' War, but they were not aware that it was merely the beginning, not the end. The Cairo Agreement played a significant role in the relative calm that prevailed. Its implementation effectively marked the end of the war for the Kitab Party and the Christian right wing. They emphasized the need to liberate Lebanese territories and redistribute the Palestinian residents in Lebanon to Arab countries. Bashir Jamal warned that fighting would resume if the Cairo Agreement was not implemented. On March 16, 1977, Kamal Jumblat, the leader of the national movement, was assassinated in the Shuf Mountains. His murder remained a mystery, although accusations pointed to Syrian President Hafez al-Assad. The Druze community erupted in anger over the killing of their leader, resulting in the deaths of around 200 Christians in the Shuf area. Walid Jumblat assumed his father's role in leading the Druze community and the Progressive Socialist Party. The situation quickly deteriorated, and renewed fighting broke out between the Palestinians and the Christian right wing in southern Lebanon. A new shift in Syrian policy occurred, with Syrian forces aligning themselves with Palestinian resistance forces. This shift was due to the clear alignment between the Christian right wing and Israeli forces. The Christian right wing, represented by the Lebanese Front, consisted of several armed militias. The most important ones included, Kitab militia, led by Bashir Jamal, son of Pierre Jamal, the Murata militia, led by Tony Frangi, son of President Suleiman Frangi, and the Tigers Militia, the military wing of the Free National Movement led by Danny Shamoun, son of Kamal Shamoun. Additionally, there were the Tanzim Militia and the Guardians of the Cedars Militia. After the Battle of Tel al zadr tensions rose among the leaders of the Lebanese Front. On June 13, 1978, units of the Lebanese forces, a party led by Bashir Jamal, launched an attack on the town of Aden. Samir Gigi led the assault with the intention of kidnapping Tony Frangi, resulting from the killing of Jaud al-Baya, a prominent Kitab member. However, armed clashes ensued, culminating in the Aden massacre, where Tony Frangi, his wife, his daughter, and over 30 of his supporters were killed. On July 7, the Kitab forces, led by Eli Hobika, launched an attack on the positions of the Tigers Militia in Ashrafi, Matin, Kizarwan, and Jbail. This event became known as the Sabra Massacre, where 83 members of the Tigers Battalion were killed. Danny Shamoun fled to West Beirut, 
seeking refuge among the Muslims he had previously fought against. By the summer of 1980, Bashir Jamal had become the sole leader of the Lebanese Front, and the only authority in East Beirut after eliminating the Maratha and Tigers militias. In March 1978, Dalal Mughrabi, a Palestinian militant, and a small group of Palestinian fighters carried out a significant operation deep within Israeli territory, killing 37 Israelis. Three days after this operation, on March 14, Israeli forces launched an attack on southern Lebanon known as Operation Litani. The Israeli army advanced into Lebanese territory, claiming that its goal was to eliminate Palestinian organizations based in that area. The United Nations Security Council issued a resolution calling for Israel's withdrawal from Lebanon, and international forces were sent to implement the resolution. Israeli forces withdrew from the area after three months, but they handed over parts of the territory they had occupied to a Lebanese army officer named Major Saad Haddad. Major Haddad later aligned himself with Israel and received support from the Mossad in establishing the South Lebanon Army Militia to oppose Palestinian presence. In January of the following year, 1979, Ali Hassan Salame, a Palestinian militant and a key figure in the PLO and Black September organization, was assassinated by Israeli forces. Lebanon had become divided into zones controlled by Israeli forces, Syrian forces, the PLO, and various Christian militias. Syria considered the Baqa Valley, especially the predominantly Christian city of Zal, to be of strategic importance due to its proximity to the Syrian border and its potential use as a route for Israeli forces to approach Damascus. Syrian forces began tightening the noose around Zal, which was held by Christian militias. Bashir Jamal sought the assistance of his Israeli allies to repel the Syrian attack. Israeli aircraft intervened, and Syria responded by deploying SAM, surface-to-air missile, batteries to the area, raising the possibility of an all-out war. However, President Hafez al-Assad stated that Syrian forces were present in Lebanon to stop the civil war. Meanwhile, artillery battles erupted in Beirut, resulting in casualties among innocent civilians. The United States intervened to find a settlement regarding Zal, and the fighting in the city ended with the withdrawal of the Lebanese forces militia, which considered the Battle of Zal a proud victory. Lebanese forces troops were deployed to maintain security in the area. In the southern region of Lebanon, artillery clashes erupted between the forces of the Liberation Organization and the Israeli army. The organization's response was notably prudent to the extent that the United States intervened upon Israel's request for a ceasefire, a move perceived by the Liberation Organization as a triumph over the Zionists. The leaders of the Zionist entity comprehended the genuine potency of the Liberation Organization, both militarily and politically, subsequent to this operation. In 1982, everyone anticipated that Israel would deliver a blow to Palestinian organizations, however, the Israeli response exceeded expectations. On the 4th of June 1982, Israeli aircraft bombarded the city of Sidon, as well as the villages of Nabatai, Demur, and the strategically significant Shikif Castle, as a prelude to a comprehensive invasion. 
This was ostensibly in response to the assassination of the Israeli ambassador in the United Kingdom by the Abu Nadal organization, originally antagonistic to the PLO. Two days later, the Israeli army entered Lebanon with 1,100 tanks, 4,000 armored vehicles, and 90,000 soldiers. The Palestinians in the south endeavored to repel this invasion, displaying remarkable valor in an unequal battle, reminiscent of the forces that faced Israel in Egypt and Syria during the 1973 war. The operation was led by Ariel Sharon, the Israeli Minister of Defense at the time, who declared that the reason was to push the PLO and Katyusha rockets 40 kilometers away from Israel's borders. However, Israeli forces advanced toward the capital, Beirut, encountering fierce resistance from Palestinian refugee camps. Consequently, the Israeli army destroyed these Palestinian camps and occupied southern Lebanon. The Syrian army managed to halt the Israeli advance and fought fiercely in the Baqa Valley, inflicting substantial losses upon the Israeli forces. Nonetheless, Syria swiftly entered into a ceasefire agreement and withdrew from the equation just five days after the commencement of hostilities between it and the Israeli army. The latter, meanwhile, captured Sidon, Tyre, and Damour, the strongholds of the Liberation Organization, and began advancing towards the main road between Beirut and Damascus, breaching the Shuf region situated in the southern part of the Lebanese mountains. On the 9th of June in the year 1982, the Israeli army reached the outskirts of Beirut and bombarded West Beirut. The Israeli Air Force successfully obliterated Syrian anti-aircraft positions, in addition to downing a Syrian MiG-21 fighter in a massive aerial engagement over the skies of Beirut. On the 14th day of the same month, the Israeli army entered East Beirut, predominantly inhabited by Christians, and besieged West Beirut, which served as the primary stronghold for the PLO. In early July, the Israeli army cut off the supply of food and water to the area. However, the forces of the Liberation Organization, along with Lebanese and Syrian forces, steadfastly defended the city. The Israeli army was unable to breach it from the south, via the Kalda region. Most of the population evacuated West Beirut, and the Palestinian leadership began contemplating withdrawal from the capital as some Lebanese voices called for their departure to avert further destruction and bloodshed. For a duration of three months, Palestinian, Lebanese, and Syrian forces resisted, inflicting significant losses upon the Israeli army, while the Zionists continued to bombard the city with internationally prohibited weaponry, including cluster and phosphorus bombs. On the 12th of August, the Israeli Air Force conducted the most ferocious and sustained aerial, naval, an artillery bombardment of Beirut, lasting for 10 continuous hours. Over 30,000 Lebanese civilians were killed, more than 40,000 were wounded, and over half a million people were displaced from the city, according to estimates. Six days later, on the 18th of August, through the mediation of the American envoy, Philip Habib, the two parties reached a ceasefire agreement. The siege on West Beirut began to ease, and U.S. President Ronald Reagan personally guaranteed the safety of Palestinian fighters' families if they departed to Tunisia. Over 14,000 Palestinian fighters, as well as the Syrian 85th Brigade, withdrew from Beirut under international protection, celebrating the fact that Israel had failed to defeat them and enter West Beirut by military force. Yasser Arafat left Beirut, heading for the Greek capital, Athens. Earlier, 
The National Rescue Council was formed at the behest of President Sarkis with the aim of mitigating the escalation of armed confrontation between Israel and the PLO. The council comprised leaders of Lebanon's major sects, including Nabi Berry, the head of the Amal movement, Walid Jumblat, the Druze leader and head of the Progressive Socialist Party, and Bashir Jamail, the commander of the Lebanese Falanges Party, who at that time was a potential candidate for the presidency. Perhaps for this reason, his forces did not participate in the battle alongside Israeli forces, as they had promised. However, the National Rescue Council failed to achieve any tangible results. On 23 August, 1982, after the end of Elias Sarkis's term, Bashir Jamal was elected president after receiving 57 out of 62 votes from the attending deputies in the parliamentary session. Israeli forces were positioned outside the council headquarters, leading his opponents to describe him as the president on the Israeli tank. On 1 September, Bashir Jamayo met with Israeli Prime Minister Munakim Begin in the Nahariya settlement, in a tense atmosphere, as Begin believed that Bashir was attempting to evade signing a peace treaty with Israel. A few days later, Sharon visited him at his residence in Bikfaya in an attempt to ease the tension. He emphasized the importance of the friendship between Israelis and Lebanese Christians. On 14 September of the same year, just before officially assuming the presidency, Bashir Jamal was addressing his Kitab party colleagues in their stronghold in Ashrafi when a bomb exploded, resulting in the deaths of Bashir and 26 Kitab members. Accusations pointed to the Syrian regime, and the operation was carried out by a Maronite Christian and member of the Syrian Social Nationalist Party named Habib Shartouni. He claimed to have executed the judgment of the Lebanese people because Bashir had allegedly sold Lebanon to Israel. A week later, Amin Jamal, Bashir's elder brother, was elected president in his place. Not long after, Israel finally managed to enter West Beirut after fierce resistance from Lebanese Nationalist Party fighters. The resistance persisted until the Gazan forces withdrew, and West Beirut was swiftly liberated from the Zionists. However, it did not escape the fire, which had been prepared as retribution for Bashir's assassination.